Hello, I'm Dr. Rupa, oral pathologist. Today we'll be discussing an important topic, salivary glands, which is seen in uh, which you have read in most of uh, the subjects. But today we'll be covering the histology of salivary glands. Now, salivary glands are a group of exocrine glands, and these have a compound tubulo acinar architecture, and the mode of secretion is merocrine in nature. What is merocrine secretion? We'll learn it in the further slides. Now let's go ahead and see a question that has been asked. The structure of salivary gland may be described as option A, mixed or compound tubulo alveolar, B, simple tubulo alveolar, C, compound acinar, and D, simple tubula. To understand this question, we should go back to the basics and see why it is classified so. Now let's see the classification of glandular epithelium. Glandular epithelium can be classified mainly on two characteristics. Firstly, the secretion, where it is secreted, whether it is secreted to the external region or to the internal part, that is inside the body cavity or outside the body cavity or on the skin. So depending on that, it is classified as exocrine gland, where the secretion is onto the skin or into the body cavity, or internally when it is secreted, it is an endocrine gland. Now exocrine glands can be further classified depending on whether a single cell is involved or a number of cells are involved. When single cell is involved, like a goblet cell, there is not much classification and no complications are present there or it is not complex. But when we are talking about a multicellular glandular epithelium, it is more complex because multicellular um, glands have two main compartments, the secretory units and the ducts. Now the ducts, depending on the structure of the duct, it can be branch duct or unbranched duct. When there is unbranching of the duct or a single duct is present, then it is a simple glandular epithelium. When there is branching, we call it as a compound gland. And also depending on the structure of the secretory unit. The secretory units can be tubular in structure or they can have an alveolar or an acinar component. That is a sac-like component, which would call it as a tubular, uh, call it as an alveolar or an acinar gland. And then it can be a combination of both tubular and acinar, where we call it as a tubulo acinar. Now, understanding this part, now let's get back to salivary glands. Salivary gland, as we know, produces its secretion into the oral cavity, so into the external. So it becomes an exocrine gland. And then it has many ductal structures. It has a ductal system. So it is branched. So it becomes a compound gland. And then it has acinar part. The secretory units are in the form of a sac. And sometimes they can have a tubular, tubulo acinar structures as in case of a mixed salivary gland. So we call it as a compound tubulo acinar gland. So in the question given, we don't have a compound tubulo acinar one, but the nearest one would be compound acinar. So that is what is the answer for this question. Now let's go ahead. Before going into the basics, basic part of histology, we have to know about the mode of secretion of saliva. Before that, what is the mode of secretion of a glandular epithelium? There are three modes, merocrine secretion, holocrine secretion, and apocrine secretion. What is merocrine secretion? In merocrine secretion, there is accumulation of the secreted part onto the apical part of the secretory cell. And when the accumulation is more, it is left out through exocytosis, released out onto the outer surface. And the cell which is producing it is intact. It doesn't die. So that is a merocrine secretion, as in case of salivary gland or sweat glands. What is a holocrine secretion? In holocrine secretion, along with the secretion, the cell dies. An example for this is sebaceous gland. And then we have a apocrine secretion. In apocrine secretions, the secretions are collected on the apical part of the secretory cell. And from there, it, uh, the secretions bud off. You know, there is pinching up of the apical part. And this is seen in mammary glands. So now we know salivary gland is compound tubulo acinar gland and the secretion mode is merocrine. Okay, now let's go ahead with the classification, the histological classification. We have already learned about the structural classification, like the major salivary glands and the minor salivary glands. What we are concentrating today is on the histological classification of salivary glands. When I talk about the histological classification, it is mainly dependent on the cells, the secretory cells which are present in the salivary glands. So these can be serous glands 
or the serous secretory units, the mucus secretory cells or the units. And then there is a combination of both serous and mucus secretory units when it is called as a mixed salivary gland. So as I told you, salivary glands can be classified depending on the secretory units or the secretory cells which are present in the asini. Now these asini may, may not be composed of only single type of secretory cell. They are normally composed of both secretory and mucus. Predominantly what is the secretion is what helps us to classify this. For example, parotid gland is predominantly serous secreting salivary gland. Whereas von Ebner gland is a pure serous secreting salivary gland. Now the sublingual gland and the posterior sublingual gland and the posterior lingual glands are predominantly mucus secreting salivary glands. The palatine and the glossopalatine salivary glands are purely mucus secreting salivary glands. Whereas the submandibular, buccal and the lingual salivary glands are mixed salivary glands. That is, they produce both serous and mucus secretions. Now let's see one of the questions. Pure mucus salivary glands are, so we already know it, we have already uh, know, seen it in the last slide. That is, the options are labial and buccal gland, glossopalatine and palatine glands, von Ebner's glands and lingual glands. The answer for this would be glossopalatine and palatine salivary glands. So what is the serous and mucus secretion? These are macromolecular components which are produced by the secretory cells. That is, depending on whether the secretion is having a lot of protein, a glycoprotein or carbohydrate content in it, it is classified as mucus and serous. Now, serous glands produce a lot of glycoproteins and mucus produce mucins. Mucins are also a type of glycoproteins with a core protein, which is an apoprotein. Now, there is a recent advance. This is just for your knowledge. It's a recent advance which says that there is no much distinction between a serous asini or a mucus asini. That is, serous cells and mucus cells concept is quite blurred now. The secretion part is, uh, you know, it, they say that a few serous cells also produce other uh, mucus mucins and mucus cells produce a lot of glycoproteins which are almost similar to the ones produced by the serous secretory cells. Structurally as well, the mucus vacuoles which, are, which we see in the future slides present in the mucus glands, they look more fused, empty and swollen. And this would be an artifactual change and absolutely no difference between a serous and a mucus cells is present. But this needs more research and what exactly it is we'll be seeing as the advancement takes place. Now let's come back to the structure of the salivary gland. Now structure of a salivary glands, basically there are two components, parenchyma and the connective tissue. The parenchymal part is epithelial in origin and the connective tissue is ectomesenchymal origin. So you'll have to go back to your first few chapters where you know what is an epithelial origin and ectomesenchymal origin, which is not covered here. Now the parenchymal parts of the salivary glands are the secretory end pieces, which are also called as the asinine. This is the terminal end piece of the salivary gland. And then the ductal system. We'll be going in deeper, uh, we'll be learning deeper into these topics later. Now the connective tissue is ectomesenchymal in origin and it forms the capsule of the salivary gland and also the stroma. The capsule uh, extends into the stroma and then it divides the gland into lobes and lobules. Now this is a gross anatomy of a salivary gland, a submandibular salivary gland. It has a capsule made up of connective tissue. The capsule here, this part complete covering the salivary gland. And then this extends inside. And then there is a division of the salivary gland into lobes and lobules. Now the connective tissue part. The connective tissue part in a H&D section, how do you appreciate it? See, it's basically eosinophilic in nature, that is pinkish in nature, to be more clear to all of you. So, this is the covering here. This is the capsule and it's made up of connective tissue and this extends inside and forms lobes. Okay, and then into the lobes, lobules. So have you understood the concept of lobes and lobules when it is dividing into a major lobe and inside the lobes it becomes the lobules. Okay, so that is the 
connective tissue. What is the other important factor about connective tissue that you have to remember is in the septa there is presence of vasculature and nerves which is required for the particular gland. So let's see an MCQ. Most of you must have you know, uh, got this as a viva question. Now the intralobular ducts are the options are striated duct and excretory duct, intercalated duct and striated duct, intercalated duct and excretory duct, intercalated duct, striated duct and excretory duct. So what are these ducts? Let's learn further uh, in the future slides. But for now, intercalated duct and striated ducts are the intralobular ducts. So to understand how the uh, structure of a salivary gland looks like, it's easy if we can compare it to a bunch of grapes. So most of us like grape, I assume so, and we'll go ahead with that. So the grape part, let's call it or compare it to asini. And then the branches, okay, you can see how the branching is here, this part to the ductal system. So whenever somebody talks to you about histology of the salivary gland, the first thing you have to think is a bunch of grape. So it becomes easy for you. The extended part of the grape here, similar to an asini, it's a sac. So it is asini. And then the secretion first move on to the first part of the duct, which we call as the intercalated duct and then into the striated ducts and then finally into the excretory ducts. So parenchymal elements are the asini and the ductal system. Now let's see the asini. Asini are the terminal endpoints or the secretory uh, units of the salivary glands. Now asini or asinus is the functional unit of the salivary gland. The structure of an asini this asini is epithelial in origin. So we have an epithelial secretory cell, a single layer of cell, which is present on the basement membrane. Depending on what is the macromolecular component produced by these cells, that is the secretory cells, these can be called as serous cells or mucus cells. Or there may be combination of serous and mucus cells, where we call it as a seromucus, uh, seromucus asini or a mixed asini. This is present on a basement membrane. And then are present of these myoepithelial cells, quite interesting cells which are present in the salivary glands, which help a lot in expelling the saliva, in uh, helping uh, for movement of the saliva through the, asini, uh, through the asini into the ductal system and the junctional complexes. Hope uh, you all remember what are the junctional complexes. Just uh, a short review or recall on that. So junctional complexes are of three types, the tight junctions, the intermediate junctions and the desmosomes. The other names, zonula occludens, zonula adherens and macula adherens. These, the, uh, these are the junctions that hold the cell together. One cell to another cell connection is by these junctional complexes. So what are the functions of junctional complex in salivary gland? First is hold the cell together. They maintain tissue homeostasis, maintain cell polarity, regular, regulate permeability and control paracellular ion influx. So now let's see serous asini in particular. What is it? What is the histology of it? How does it look under a light microscopy and how does it look under electron microscopy? Now light microscopy, when I take it, you know, uh, speak about light microscopy, you'll have to remember two words hematoxinophilic and eosinophilic. Something that is bluish is hematoxinophilic. Something that is pinkish is eosinophilic. And when I'm talking about electron microscopy, you will have to remember two words, electron dense and electron electrolucent areas. So these are the things, the terms which if you don't know, please go back and read through what is electron dense and electron lucent. Okay, so serous asini. Serous asini are oval or spherical in shape. They contain around 12 to 8 to 12 serous cells, secretory serous cells, which surround a central lumen. The central lumen is star shaped, and the star shape is mainly because of extension of the lumen in between the cells. And these extensions are called as intercellular canaliculi. So, this is how a serous cell asini would look under uh, HND staining. So these are 
this whole group is one asana i think you can appreciate it well here one more here so this sh shape of it it's oval or round okay and the cells number of cells in each of this asana is 8 to 12 now under light microscopy how does it look like uh, so let let me explain it better with a hnd uh, image okay it's an hnd stain section of a serous asana and a 40x magnification so as soon as you look at uh, it under a light microscope under lower magnification you wouldn't appreciate it this is under 40x magnification so now what we learned initially what does it consist of it consists of an asana consisting of cells each one of this is a secretory cell okay and this is round in structure 8 to 12 secretory cells in each asana now let's consider an individual secretory cell okay so pyramidal in shape it is pyramidal in shape and it has a broad base and a pointed apex this a cell if we think of has a nucleus it has other cytoplasmic organelles now what is most important for us to understand here is what is the location of the nucleus where are the other cytoplasmic granule cytoplasmic organelles and what are some major or important secretory units present and where are these vacuoles or vesicles present that is the major difference between a serous uh, cell and a mucous cell now in a serous cell the nucleus is present in the basal third so basal third dividing the cell into three part so it is the basal part of the cell so basal third is presence of a nucleus and above that supranuclear area that is above the nucleus you find a lot of secretory vesicles and these secretory vesicles are also called as zymosin uh, granules and they are eosinophilic in nature and the reason for it is what are they what are these serous secretion they are proteins so normally they stay eosinophilic okay and then for production of the protein we need a lot of rough endoplasmic reticulum which is normally present in the basolateral area of the nucleus and on the lateral surface or slightly even around the nucleus so this is where you find the rough endoplasmic reticulum okay now the electron microscopic structure of a serous cell so it has a basal plasma membrane and this is thrown into irregular foldings multiple irregular foldings this helps to increase the surface area by almost 60 times which helps in diffusion of water and minerals which is required for the formation of saliva so saliva just doesn't you know is formed it is obtained from the tissue fluids which is present outside so this helps in absorption of a lot of uh, water and minerals from the interstitial tissue which is present or the tissue fluids which are present now the plasma membrane on the lateral regions and the apical region are again thrown into different foldings and also there is presence of microvilli and this modification is to increase surface area for secretion so on the basal part whatever happens is for the absorption from the tissue fluid and from the apical and on the lateral surface of the of the cell there is secretion into the lumen takes place so this is an electron uh, microscopic picture of how a serous cell would look like so this is the basal area the basal plasma membrane part where you find a lot of foldings here like this okay and then the lateral surface also has multiple foldings and on the apical region there are microvilli present so well, the other cytoplasmic organelles that are found are the rough endoplasmic reticulum prominent golgi apparatus abundant mitochondria and synthetic cytoplasmic organelles are also seen now the rough endoplasmic reticulum they are placed parallel to one another and usually found on the basal and the lateral areas of the nucleus which we call as the basolateral area now golgi apparatus they have several stacks 
which are seen again on the lateral surface and on the apical surface of the nucleus. Abundant mitochondria are dispersed in the basal and lateral regions of the nucleus. And uh, the synthetic cytoplasmic organelles are present in the perinuclear region. Perinuclear is around the nucleus, okay? And the rest is the resecretory granules. Okay, let's look at an image of an ultrastructure of serous cell. So it has the nucleus at the basal third, the rough endoplasmic reticulum present on the basolateral surface of the nucleus, the Golgi apparatus present at the apical end and the lateral surface, and then a lot of secretory granules. Yeah, these secretory granules are membrane bound. So they are bound by a membrane and they are normally electron dense. If it is a mature granule, it's an electron, uh, electron dense. And if it is immature granule, it is electrolucent. Okay. Now, secretory granules, they are up, uh, abundant in the apical third and they are closely packed to one another. Usually one micro, um, micrometer in diameter, round and membrane bound, eosinophilic in nature. When we look at them in a HND and section, they are eosinophilic in nature. And they can be visualized in a semi-thin plastic embedded tissue section, which is stained with toluidine blue or any specific cytochemical technique. And how is it stained is an important MCQ for you. Okay, so just remember that it is stained with toluidine blue. Okay, now a serous cell electron microscopy, how does it look like? This is mainly a section of a parotid gland. So, zymosine granules at the apical third. Yes, this is the apical third of the cell. The basal third composes of the nucleus. Fine, and these are the zymosine granules. Yes, membrane bound. Most of them here, what you see are electron dense. Okay, can you see these? One here and few here. These are electrolucent, okay? And these are immature granules. So they are not ready for secretion yet. It is these mature granules which fuse to each other and then they get secreted into the lumen of the salivary gland or into the lumen of the acini. Now, what is the content of these secretory granules? They contain glycolated proteins which are released into the vacuoles, okay? As I told you, immature granules are paler or they're electron lucent and mature granules are dense and they are towards the luminal surface. The secretion is watery, protein rich with many enzymes, okay? The cells show presence of acid phosphatase, esterases, glucosidases, glucurinidase and galactoside activity. Now, one of the uh, um, MCQs, which of the following is not correct about serous glands? Option A, they are specialized for synthesis, storage and secretion of proteins. So now you already know that this is a correct one. They contain secretory granules in the apical cytoplasm and the secretion of granule content occurs by exocytosis. This sentence is also correct. Now they are pyramidal in shape. Yes. Now the last one, the apical portion stains strongly with carbohydrate stains like Pass. Now, what is the secretion of the serous gland? It is glycoprotein. And we also learned that this glycoprotein stains with toluidine blue. So, this statement is wrong. So, the answer for this question would be apical portion stains strongly with carbohydrate stains like pass. Okay. Now, let's go ahead and learn about mucus acini. So these mucus acini may be tubular or elliptical in shape. They contain a cluster of mucus cells. The central lumen is larger and it lacks intercellular canaliculi. And if they are present, they are not prominent. Okay. So this is an HND section of a mucus uh, salivary gland. An example for that is sublingual salivary glands. So let's just quickly recall which is a pure uh, mucus secreting salivary gland. It's glossopalatine gland and palatine minor salivary glands okay and a purely serous secreting salivary gland is von Ebner's gland so please don't forget these two points you can get an MCQ on both of them okay now the mucus acini the mucus cell under light microscopy how does it look like the cell is pyramidal or columnar it has a broad base as we saw in a serous cell and a narrow apex 
the nucleus is flattened why is this flattening present and it is present at the basal cell now the nucleus is pressed against the base the flattening is because of presence of mucus droplets in the serous acini we saw zymosin granules whereas in mucus acini there is presence of mucus droplets these droplets are also membrane bound okay and they stain empty or they do not stain much in your hnd stain okay they do not take up any stain now <clears throat> the special stains for mucus acini or mucus cell is musicamen or pus or alcyon blue okay this re uh, reveals the mucus droplets and the uh, cytoplasm in the basal portion okay it is basophilic and this is because of abundant rough endoplasmic reticulum so this is how a uh, mucus acini would look like it can be tubular okay or can be also oval in shape has a lot of cells here this is one cell this is another cell okay you can see that the cytoplasm is you know completely clear or you know you just find few you know points or you can say scars uh, eosinophilic areas and then the nucleus is at the basal at the base okay this is the nucleus which is completely flattened in the serous one it was round okay and it was in the basal third here it is flattened and this flattening is because of the presence of mucus droplets these mucus droplets are empty when we you know and see it under the hnd section because they don't take up any stain it doesn't take up a eosinophilic stain or a hematoxinophilic stain and for these you need special staining okay the special staining would be pass or alcyon blue okay and then the basic uh, the basal part of the cell is basophilic that is these secretions are again glycoprotein secretions and for pro production you need rough endoplasmic reticulum and this rough endoplasmic reticulum is present in the basal area of the cell so when the basal area of the cell contains rough endoplasmic reticulum it has ribosomes which are hem hematoxinophilic so this gives that area basophilic appearance okay